Welcome, 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 and one more welcome to everybody out there for joining us for our continuing series where we interview professors, reporters, writers, columnists, activists, anybody on the left, anybody on the right, as long as people have thoughtful perspectives and we want to provide them unedited and unaltered directly to you so that you could do this thing that was popular when I was in high school called thinking for yourself. With us today is Frances Lee. She's a professor of politics and public affairs at Princeton. She's also a big, big name in the field of political uh, polarization. She's been referenced by many of the other people that I've uh, interviewed, so it is a big treat to have her here today. Uh, she's jointly appointed in the Department of Politics and the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, where she is a professor of politics and public affairs. Uh, one second, let me check something real quick. Okay. Lee has broad interest in American politics with a special focus on congressional politics, national policymaking, party politics, and representation. She's the author of Insecure Majorities, Congress and the Perpetual Campaign, and Beyond Ideology, Politics, Principles, and Partisanship in the U.S. Senate. She's also co-author of Sizing Up the Senate, The Unequal Consequences of Equal Representation, and a textbook. Congress and its members. Her research has appeared in the American Political Science Review, American Journal of Political Science, Perspectives on Politics, Journal of Politics, Legislative Studies, Quart Quarterly, and other outlets. She's also editor of the Cambridge Elements Series in American Politics and a series editor for the Chicago Studies in American Politics. And she's been co-editor of the Legislative Studies Quarterly from 2014 to 2019. She earned her BA from the University of Southern Mississippi and her PhD from Vanderbilt University. She's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she's also chair in congressional policymaking from the John W. Klug Center, Library of Congress. She also won an award from the Barbara Sinclair Lectureship on the American Political Science Association, Distinguished Scholar Teacher, University of Maryland, the D.B. Hardiman Prize, the Richard F. Fino Jr. Award, the Steigler Award, APSA Congressional Fellowship Award, the D.B. Hederman Prize again, and the E.E. E. Schatz Schneider Award. 1998. Uh, some of the work that we've already covered, Can America Govern Itself, Insecure Majorities, The Oxford Handbook of American Congress, Beyond Ideology, Sizing Up the Senate. So the professor's very, very well experienced at studying Congress, the Senate, House of Representatives. And this is what led us to this book, which is where I found her. But before we do that, let's check in and see how well we did. Professor, did I say anything wrong? Is there something I need to correct? Did I, I mispronounce anything? Nothing wrong. You uh, you certainly uh, covered a lot of uh, a lot of my bio, and that that's great. <laughs> okay, okay. To get right to the meat and potatoes, I was interviewing people on political polarization, and many of them said, "You have got to read this book." And so I did. I got the book. I read it, and I have lots of questions about it. But before we get to that, why did you write this book? Why did you write it when you wrote it? And before you answer, if you can also talk as an academic and just somebody who's living in America at this times, um, as if I've been in a cave for five years, what's going on in America? Is polarization an issue? Why did this book seem like a good idea? What was it responding to? What were the uh, issues that you were trying to look at and you thought, oh, this is what I need to write about at this now? Why was this an important issue and why did you choose to write about it at this time? Well, I'd been thinking about the motives uh, for members of Congress to behave in partisan ways, to work with their parties, to undercut the reputation of the opposing party, to define themselves against um, the opposing party, you know, to think about uh, uh, the logic of partisanship. I'd been working on that since having served as a congressional fellow on Capitol Hill during the Bush administration. So my, uh, 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 my first book that came out of that uh, experience as a congressional fellow was uh, Beyond Ideology, which looked at the political motives for partisan conflict in Congress, separate from the fact that Republicans tend to be conservatives and Democrats tend to be liberals. In other words, it's not all philosophical differences between the parties that produces the level of party conflict that we've seen. That grew out of my time as a fellow where I observed that it didn't seem to matter what the issue was. 
and whether you were able to identify what the philosophical stakes might be in terms of uh, you know what defines a liberal versus a conservative it didn't didn't matter that it still broke down on party lines so why why was conflict in congress so rigidly partisan so that was the first book and the logic that I laid out in that book was sort of enduring. You know, there were always reasons why you'd expect parties to work together based on uh, work together internally and to come into conflict with the opposition. Um, at, you know, uh, uh, you know, looking at the logic I identified in that book, and so I wanted to understand why it's so much more partisan now. You know, what do, what caused the increase, and. In thinking that through, and and spend you know spending a lot of time just just studying the 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 um, the roll call votes that members of Congress cast, and also demand you know what how do they set the floor agenda? What what do they decide to take votes on? Just studying that, I had sort of an aha moment. I I, I remember I remember when it happened. Where I thought to myself, the logic differs in this contemporary era, post Reagan where um, the party in power ho uh, holds office insecurely, that the party in power um, sees a threat from the out party, and the out party believes it has a pathway in. It's is very different um, from a, a, a Congress like was um, the case through the 20th, through much of the 20th century, before 1980 and after the New Deal, after 1932, where the Democrats were the dominant party in Congress. They had majorities almost all the time. Republicans didn't believe they could become a majority party through much of that time period, and Democrats were not worried about losing it. That's an environment that that where it's easier to work across party lines because you're not looking to position yourself against the opposition to set up issues on a national basis for the upcoming election. So there was just less orientation towards towards those next elections, you know, less concern about what would happen. Um, the elections were much less nationalized because it, it just didn't matter to the country as a whole, for example, which um, which party won those seats in Georgia, whereas, of course, you know, the Senate seats in Georgia determined, you know, which party would have a majority in the Senate uh, in 2020. And uh, and, you know, in, in periods where you've got close um, uh uh, close majorities, narrow majorities, where uh, either it's a toss-up, either party could win. You know, politics is sort of balanced on a knife's edge. Under those circumstances, the focus is very much on the national stakes. You know, who's going to have a majority in the next elections, and that create that creates more incentive for the parties to stick together, and also to define issues where they can say, we are a better alternative to the other guys. Why should you support us and not the other party? Well, here are the reasons. And so um, it's a more confrontational style of partisanship in a more competitive era. And, uh, and that's basically what we've seen. Since 1980, the Senate has been in play. And since 1994, the House has been in play. Uh, and so to think about that, uh, that uh, uh, logic as helping to understand why our contemporary politics is as uh, conflictual as it is and as partisan as it is. We, just for everyone at home, as Democrats and Republicans continue to vie for political advantage, Congress remains paralyzed by partisan conflict. The last two decades have been have seen some of the least productive Congresses in recent history, is usually explained by the growing ideological gulf between the parties. But this explanation misses another fundamental factor influencing the dynamic. In contrast to politics through most of the 20th century, the contemporary Democratic and Republican parties compete for control of Congress at relative parity. And this has dramatically changed the party's incentives and strategies in a way that has driven contentious partisanship characteristic of contemporary American politics. Uh, that there seems to be uh, a lot of evidence for what you're saying. I was wondering if you could explain, maybe that's too small, but there was this one chart I really liked. Let me see if I can um, adjust that. I was hoping you could explain this one chart, if I can get this 
modified correctly. Oops. Uh, I won't do it. Uh, I don't know if you can see this chart. It was, it's divergence from partisan parity, 19, 1861 to 2016. <laughs> and a protracted area of partisan parity. And uh, so I think what you're showing here is there was uh, a lot of partisanship for most of the U.S. history, and there were brief periods where we didn't. I, I could be wrong on that. Um, are you able to see the chart? Is it yes, I can. I'm happy to explain that. So, please, please. Um, so th that that chart rests on a simple set of averages. So, for each uh, for for each election year, I average together the share of the two party vote that the Democratic Party candidate received for president the share of Senate seats Democrats hold and the share of um, House seats Democrats hold. So, you know, how many seats do Democrat, uh, so in other words, Democratic Party strength nationally. So I average those three together and that gives me a, um, a gauge of not just, um, uh, you know, the, not just the support of the uh, that the, the, the Democrats receive in any particular institution, but overall. So it gives us a sense of the partisan balance. And then I take the difference from zero. And so I can show periods where um, one party is more dominant than the other. So you know, I'm just displaying partisan dominance. And in this figure, I'm displaying the, um, uh, I, I, those are, that's average across decades. And so you can see in that post-Civil War period, the first half the, the, of the, the figure, the, 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 the empty. Um, yeah, the empty, the empty blank squares. Um, the, the empty bars, line. yes. Yeah. So that shows you um, periods of Republican dominance where, okay. the, where Democrats did very poorly. And so the Democrats, so, were, they were, so, Repub so it, this is difference from zero. So, so, um, so the, you know, Rep Rep Democrats did very poorly across those three indicators, share of the vote for president, share of Senate seats, share of House seats. But Rep so it was a Republican era okay. before, before um, uh, the Civil War. I mean, I mean, before the New Deal, after the Civil War. Right. After the New Deal, it's largely a demo, it's large, Democrats dominate until you get to the contemporary era where neither party dominates. So, you know, you've got a very close balance across those three institutions, the president, the House and the Senate, uh, where Democrats don't have much of a, 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 of a, a advantage over Republicans and vice versa. Um, so it's just a way of sort of visualizing the competitiveness of the political system. And so you, you just see it's parity. It's, there were some previous eras. So you look at the 1880s. 1910 uh, eight, uh, and 1950s. Yes, those were closely competitive eras as well. They were short, though. Right. And they're really different from the contemporary period where we've had, a, we've had knife's edge politics, closely competitive politics the whole time since 1980. Uh, and so, you know, it's a fiercely competitive political system. And that's not what I want. The point I want to make uh, 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 from that in the book is that that's not normal for U.S. history. Right. Right. So just for everybody following along, because we like to take academic stuff and make it available for the basic user in America, the empty boxes on the left represent the Democrats are running the show. And that goes from no, 18. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The Democrats are not running the show in that first. That's Republicans running the show. I'm sorry. The My, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The blank boxes. I'm sorry. The blank boxes represent the Republicans running the show roughly from 1860 to 1920. The black boxes starting in the 1930s and going to the 1970s show periods of majority Democratic control. And what's unusual since the 1860s to the 2010s, I believe you're saying, Professor, is these periods of intense competition. Uh, they were brief. They, it was a brief one in the 1880s, and then it disappeared, and a brief one in the 1910s, and then it disappeared, and a brief one in the 1950s, and then it, it disappeared. And now our problem is 
it's just staying. It's not a brief period. It just goes and it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. In the past, we'd see a brief period and then it'd be knocked out of it. Now we're four terms in of this same hyperpolarization election. And that's just dysfunctional for a functional federal government. Is that is that roughly correct? That's right. And it's not four terms. It's four decades now and four still decades. going. Four, four decades, decades and still going. Um, and so it's, it's you know, our polarized era is also a fiercely competitive era. And those things are connected. Uh, and so I don't think you can understand the intense um, polarization that we see without also recognizing that it's that the, the rivalry between the parties is as intense as it is. And we've never seen this period of four decades going on of intense polarization before in American history. So this is this is new. This is new. OK. And uh, say the last thing you said again, please. Uh, so it's 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 a rivalry. Right. Um, that gets driven by the, this close competition. You know, that it, uh, the, the, the parties in that sense aren't necessarily different from other organizations that are engaged in close competition, that this rivalry drives some of that animosity um, that we see between Republicans and Democrats in this current era. And so if if we had a return to an era where one party is clearly dominant, we might see a reduction in political polarization. I think you would. Yes. OK. OK. Uh, I want to read a quote from the book, if I may. Sure. Scholars have tended to attribute increased party conflict to ideological polarization. This is on page 200. Meaning a widening philosophical gap between the two parties. There is no question that the parties in Congress are indeed more ideologically distinct today than they were in much of the 20th century. The causes of this, of this phenomenon are not well understood, however. Polarization in Congress does not seem to have been driven by voters moving to the ideological polls, though voters became better sorted by ideology in response to the cues. Regional realignment has unquestionably made the parties much more ideologically cohesive internally and more differentiated from one another. In particular, the realignment of white Southerners into the Republican Party made Republicans more uniformly conservative and Democrats more uniformly liberal. However, the regional sorting of the parties cannot begin to account for the full extent of increased partisanship of Congress because growing differences between the parties extend throughout the whole country. Um, so I think what you're saying is other people are saying, oh, it's ideological polarization. It's the media. It's social media. It's Donald Trump. And I think what you're doing is you're taking a long view and going, if we if we take a step back and look over the last hundred years, this really seems to be a systemic problem. And it really is about American democracy kind of works best when one party really is dominant. We have this idea of it needs to be a grudge match and someone barely wins every time, but that's just because that's what we've seen over the last four decades. If you really look at America, it functioned better with kind of one dominant party and one minority party. Is, is that roughly accurate? Right. Yes. Um, I think, you know, when you have a circumstance where the parties are so evenly matched, it focuses them on politics and on questions of political advantage in ways that um, are less center stage in a less competitive system. Note also that what, what, what it means when one party dominates, it means the American people have a strong preference. And that, so the American people in some sense have sort of decided and they have given a mandate, if you will, or at least the reins, the reins of power to one party. Um, they withhold that in this closely competitive era. A party might get unified government, meaning control of both the presidency, the House and the Senate in recent years, but they can only hold it for two years before there's a backlash. You know, voters are not happy with either party. And so neither party has shown itself able to win an enduring majority. Uh, and and so I think that also reflects the challenges of governing in this era because the American people are dissatisfied with their alternatives. I, I remember they were talking about um, Dwight Eisenhower, and he became president. And they said, see, there's a Republican president. Um, but he came after when it was the, uh, the Democrats were largely in control. And one of the things I found interesting was they were saying, well, yeah, he's a Republican, and yeah, he's a military guy, 
and, and he kind of thought that way. But a lot of fellow Republicans were angry with Eisenhower because they wanted him to attack the New Deal. And Eisenhower basically said, the New Deal is part of America. Like, I'm going to do other re conservative stuff. I'm not going to go take down the New Deal because that's that's who we are as Americans. And he kind of accepted that and moved forward. And you look at Reagan. Um, Reagan had to do a lot of compromising what, with um, Tip O'Neill in order to get legislation passed. And so there does seem to see, be this pattern of strong presidents coming, but kind of recognizing the mood of the country. And I think now you're saying we're getting to who cares what the mood of the country is. I'm about my party. And well, there, there isn't. It's hard to even say what the mood of the country is when you've got election outcomes as narrowly decided as they are. That's, that's the right. president barely win. Uh, you know, somebody has to win, um, but um, it, it's close. And uh, and so th there's little sense that the American people have spoken and have indicated what they want. You know, elections don't convey that kind of meaning when they're so narrowly decided. So voters end up feeling like they haven't been heard. Right. They, they feel like they haven't been heard, but it's also because the voters themselves are so divided that they don't send a clear message to Washington. I think you're, you're also saying that this is the cause for polarization, at least at congressionally and at the elite level. But you are saying the average voters are somewhat ideologically sorted, but that's not the reason for the polarization. But you're not denying there is kind of a, a sort and people seem a lot more angry at each other across parties. That's fair to say? Yes, uh, that's right. And I think that that, I mean, first of all, what you can see is if you study polarization in the electorate and polarization in Congress, you can see that polarization in Congress happened before polarization in the electorate. And it's much more complete in Congress than it is in the electorate. The American people are not nearly as partisan as their elected representatives are. So, I think that sort of undercuts the idea that what the, the level of partisanship that we see in Congress is just, you know, following what the American people um, are asking for, if you will. You know, that it's not, it does more than merely reflect. I think, you know, one of the reasons why there is so much partisan animosity among voters, why Republicans don't want to see their children marry Democrats and vice versa. Thank you. Um, <laughs> they don't want to see that. Um, because they uh, they've received messages from elites for decades now about wh why the other party is bad and why the other party um, w would do harm uh, to the country if they gained power. Um, like they've received um, you know you know steady diet a steady diet of harsh rhetoric. Um, denouncing the opposing party throughout all of this closely competitive period. And so, you know, I think you can't understand the, the um, animosity in the electorate without taking stock of the close competition between the parties and, and, and what that does to political incentives in uh, among our elected representatives. Like they const they're constantly uh, attacking the opposition. I, th I have a chapter in the book on party message operations. You know, they've built up all these um, uh, uh, offices and hired all these staffers uh, who work on Capitol Hill, whose job it is is to come up with partisan attacks. Uh, and so then that disseminates out to the public. And so the public, you know, receives this, these messages and that reinforces them in their partisanship, makes them dislike the opposition even more seen the studies saying uh it was i think 2012 it was like 30 percent of americans wouldn't date someone outside of the party and you go back to like over i think 2016 2017 and it jumps to 55 percent. so it's now more than half of americans won't date someone's out of the party they also won't marry there's also evidence uh i think covered by the atlantic magazine on uh, school segregation by politics uh i've also interviewed a lot of people many different states where they're saying i lost friends i lost family there's people I can't talk to anymore. And it wasn't not, it was not like that before Trump, but I never bought the America was perfect and great. And there was no problems. And then Trump came and single-handedly broke it all by himself. I'm like, there had to be things going on. And so I like this theory because you're going, no, 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 go back, go back, go back. Trump did not start four decades ago. The ground was being seeded by other people. Politicians were being, I think what you're saying is, and tell me if I'm wrong, the elections are so close 
So you really got to eke out a win. And hey, it's nice to go, I'm going to run a clean election and, and, and be a moral good guy. But when he gets close and push comes to shove and it's, are we going to win or lose? Dirty tricks are now back on the table. I it's a dog people. fight. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. So, hey, I got to, uh, uh, you know, my plan for welfare reform and healthcare reform isn't activating the voters enough. I need to not, now start dog whistling ideology in order to eke out that win. Or I guess we just lose and we go home. And they don't want to do that. And so they're they're doing this. And they've been doing it, unfortunately, for about four decades. And eventually that idea just bubbles up in people's minds. That's all they hear. The other side's evil, horrible. If we lose to them, it's the end of America. The moon is going to crash into the earth. And, you know, you hear this for two, three generations. You start to internalize it. Is that is that roughly what you're saying? Yes, that's what I'm saying. How many times have we heard that this is the most important election of our lives? You know, we hear that every time and it's because they because they are doing everything they can to excite the voters to side with them and so it's a very um overheated uh, political environment in great part because it is such a closely competitive political environment so my my two questions for you would be is it possible to get america back to where one party is dominant um like we had for the longest time and the other one that's related is if it is or is not possible, let's say you had a magic wand. I would, this is a, a game I always play. Let's say you had a magic wand. You could do this. Poof. Anything you want happens. You have this magic wand. You have the ability to get everyone in Congress to start behaving whatever way you think is correct. How long to deprogram the American people since it's taken four decades to get them this angry? Could we just, uh, hey, I got, I, poof, I struck my wand. Everybody in AOC is hugging Donald Trump. And two weeks later, everybody in America forgets this built up anger. Or are we looking at now something that's been so built and so cooked for so long, it's going to take generations to get out of? Which one, Professor? It's a very self-reinforcing dynamic for sure. Uh, that... Um, uh, you know, it's hard to break out of the logic that we've seen in American politics over the past f four decades. That if we look back at that uh, that chart uh, that you've displayed, um, what we see is that l long term eras of one party dominance follow major crises. So the Republican dominance after the Civil War owes a great deal to the Civil War itself. Um, that the Democratic Party for a long time after the Civil War was seen as a Southern Party, and the Southern Party was the party of rebellion. rebellion. Um, after um, 1932, the Great Depression, the Great Depression begins with Republicans in power, and that's very discrediting of them. And so it was very hard for them to build back trust after the uh, economy just coming apart under the, on their watch. So these huge crises in American politics um, are at the root of those long uh, stretches of one party dominance. Now, am I wishing for a, a crisis of, 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 of that kind of scale? No, I wouldn't. Um, but that does seem to be about what it takes to create uh, a, a real lasting advantage for one party. Or it's hard to generalize. You know, I've got to, we've got, We've got, uh, you know, uh, more than a century to look at, but um, we only have, uh, you know, two lengthy periods of one party dominance. First, the Republicans, the long stretch, and then Democrats, long stretch. So it's it, you're sort of pushing at the limits of what I uh, can gain insight into from our historical record. Um, but um, uh, it, broad brush, I, you know, my... Uh, I'd, I'd characterize um, a period of one party dominance as stemming, is growing out of a crisis of some kind. Um, and so it's hard to wish for something like that. Um, but short of the American people sort of choosing between the parties, I mean, that's basically what we had under, the, under those uh, long stretches of one party dominance. You had an American electorate that, pre that in a persistent way, preferred one party to the other right and what we have that we just not have not seen that in the contemporary era the two parties are pretty evenly matched and uh 
the American people swing a bit and adjust enough. You know, that red state, blue state map that we've seen since the 20, the 2000 presidential election. So mm-hmm. we've had, you know, more than 20 years of, uh, of that landscape. That, um, uh, that, that means that not very many voters uh, can decide who becomes the president. You know, that is just right. you know, just small swings Thank in a you. few swing states mm-hmm. determine the outcome. And so under those under those circumstances, you know, neither party is secure in power. That's so that's why I called my book Insecure Majorities. Uh, <laughs> it's true of the presidency as well. And uh, and so uh, they'd have to just keep fighting it out in a landscape like that until the American people some level have a preference for one party over the other that lasts uh, I think we're stuck okay let me ask you a potential uh, maybe a potentially difficult question maybe not you were talking about how in the past there was the Civil War and then you know the Republicans handled that better than the Democrats and the American people said you know what you you have the right vision for the country for a while and then we had the New Deal And Roosevelt pushed that through and people said, you know what, you you Democrats have the right vision for America. And now we're at a a position where there's no preference for either party. And you were saying, well, how did the dominance happen before? Well, there was a major crisis and then one party, I guess, responded better than the other. And there was a preference. And what worries me is that we've had three major crises and no party has risen to the top. We had the terrorist attack the first time we were attacked on our soil ever. Um, outside of uh, Pearl Harbor, I think. And if you really want, you could really say ever since 1812. Uh, The 2008 global economic recession, we hadn't seen something like that since the 1930s. And then we had the COVID pandemic. We hadn't seen something like that since the 1916 Spanish flu. That did not result in either party running to the top. Still is polarized now. And so my question to you is, given that it's been four decades and that the previous periods were only one decade long, and now we're in a period of four times that, is it possible that we just never return to one party dominance? It's certainly possible. It's certainly possible. Another alternative is that um, uh, a new party arises. A third uh, party. Yeah, a new party. It's possible. I mean, the Republican Party was a new party uh, formed just before the Civil War and then became one of our two major parties. So, you know, big change can happen. I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out, but it's hard to foresee it. Uh, right now, it seems that all the incentives uh, push towards stasis and push towards a continuation of the politics that we currently see. I can't see around the corner. You know, what is, right. you know, what would change it? Right. I just, I just wonder because I love maps, I love charts, and I love patterns. And this very clearly is saying the period of hyperpartisanship is a fluke. It's a blip. It's it's a abnormality. It happens, and then we go back to kind of our normal pattern. And it's been that way for over a century. And now we're in decade one, decade two, decade three, decade four. This thing normally ends after ten years. We're four hundred percent in. Maybe it broke the mold. That's what Good. I'm thinking. Of. Maybe it broke it's very the mold. Possible. Yeah, it's very possible. It's interesting, though. This coexists with a lot of one-party dominance at the state level. So there are many states that are governed by one party in an enduring way. Um, and yet at the national level, the parties are evenly matched. And it's, a, it's, it's sort of mysterious to think about. You know, how, do you, how do you add up 50 states, many of which are safe for one party and are really controlled by one party at the state level and produce this even competition nationally. But it is what we have. That is bizarre. I didn't know that. So that's a good point. I I have seen that. I never put that together until you just said that. So there are states like California. It's one party dominant, whether you like it or not. And it's been that way for a lot since Schwarzenegger was governor. So it's been a while. Uh, and, And then there's other places like that. And then yet, we don't have that at the national level. So we still have these states dominated by one party, but we never could get back to the nation being dominated by one party. That is a, a weird difference. That's kind of, that is bizarre. Um, mm-hmm. Any theories why that might be? I'm not asking. I, don't, I just, I, don't, I, don't, I do not, I don't know. I've thought a lot about it. It's for me, it's very hard to figure out how this, how these things can coexist. 
That is bizarre. That is bizarre. I okay, haven't heard of that before. Uh, other this, so we need to have a third party or maybe some new type of an emergency that one party does well, and that would get us theoretically back to the part of our traditional pattern of one party being in dominance. Potentially. I mean, Potentially. that. I mean, we don't have, like I said, we, we, we don't have many cases to work with before. You know, you had the Civil War crisis and you had the, the, the Great Depression. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that seemed to be very important for shaping the electoral landscapes for long periods afterwards. But, um, you know, what would it take to redo, to do that again? Uh, it's hard to say. I wish I could give you a, I wish I could give you a, a, a better answer, one that could um, give you a sense of exactly what to look for. But um, you're doing perfect. You're doing yeah. perfect. Well, that's what these interviews are for, is not for my opinion, but for the viewers to see this and go, this is how far the science has gone, and and they don't have an answer for everything. And here's some of the remaining questions. And here's what we do know, and here's what we don't know, so that everyone can follow along. And I like the fact that you're saying, here's what we know. And here's what we don't know. And we took it this far. There's still more questions. It's a big problem. Not everyone has every aspect of it figured out. We're still figuring it out, you know, and we're the top people researching it. And we're still occasionally going, I, I don't know. I, I, it's uh, I, it's bad, I, I, you know, and I, well, that's not a metric. But I, it's, I think that's refreshing to see that, that honesty. So I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Let's assume one party never comes back to be dominant. It's still hyperpartisan, barely winning elections. If we've been doing this for four decades, and that's been encouraging the elites to say, this is the most important election ever, like you say, and the other side's the bad guys. And all that's gotten is us to get people so angry that they'll do something like January 6th. Can I imagine that if this doesn't get fixed, we're just looking forward to a future of increased citizen polarization? I mean, nothing about our current politics um, has uh, dialed down the harshness of the political rhetoric that Americans are hearing. Uh, in fact, uh, in our uh, news landscape, it's become much easier for people to stay siloed into information streams that reinforce their biases. You know, you get Democratic news sources and Republican news sources now. So, um, you know, you know, so much about the political system reinforces these uh, existing patterns. One thing that I would say that can disrupt them. Please. It, is it's it, it, it's not to say that you know you mentioned so you mentioned the the crises the financial crisis you mentioned uh, 9/11 and you mentioned COVID. Each of those crises gave rise to major legislation in Congress that was passed in a bipartisan way, and so sometimes things just happen in the world that both parties find themselves able to agree enough to work together to respond to that crisis. Uh, and so those kinds of disruptions, although they haven't risen to the level of reshaping the electoral landscape, they do reshape the political landscape in Washington for short periods, short bursts of major action. Right, right. Um, and so, uh, and so that that kind of punctuation keeps us from being stuck in a. Uh, uh, in just trench warfare, or, you know, between Republicans and Democrats on domestic policy. So it's uh, trench warfare with periods of, I think it's called a superordinate threat that uh, brings us all together. Like Ronald Reagan said, if aliens invaded, it'd bring all the humans together. That, he said that. I'm not endorsing that as a plan. But, <laughs> well, That's an idea of a good crisis that might bring us together. Right? <laughs> uh, my, my, my friend from New York was talking about how Congress held the first official hearings on UFOs this week. Uh, they did a four hour session. I'm not speaking. I'm just, that's where it came. I'm not saying I'm just, you know, whatever. Uh, watch the movie Prometheus. It's the best of the entire alien franchise. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Last questions, professor. We're winding down. I want to say thank you for your time. Here's my favorite question to ask everybody. You're not you. You're not me. 
You're a third party person who's going to watch this video. You don't know who they are, what they're like, what they think. They're watching this video and they say, wow, I learned a lot. I, I never heard that theory. Boy, does that explain a lot. Um, we went through the charts and they're struggling to remember everything. But they keep saying to themselves, there was this one thing that the professor said. And I struggle to remember all the stuff they were covering. But there was this one thing. It's five days after I've watched that video. And I cannot get this one thing the professor said out of my head. What is that one thing you want a random person you'll never meet to not be able to stop thinking about five days from now as far as political polarization goes? I want them to understand that this is a 50-50 country in partisan terms. And uh, it's been that way for a long time. And that that reality is very important for understanding our politics. The rivalry between the parties is a rivalry for power that's conducted on an even playing field where either party can win. And that, that you know, when they hear overheated rhetoric coming from Washington, they need to remember, well, everybody's facing a close competition for power and take it with a grain of salt, you know, sort of recognize, recognize what game is being played, if you will. Not to say it's a game, it's just merely a game. The stakes are high, but it, 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 uh, it, is, um, it, uh, it is a competitive um, um, marketplace for ideas uh, and a competitive um, political system uh, in which the, 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 the two parties uh, face off at e equal strength. And so, you know, in that in that kind of context, um, we should expect a lot of the behavior that we see. It's understandable in light of that. Um, and so, I, you know, for me, as I think about um, uh, that reality, it it helps me have some empathy for our political leaders in such in, in these circumstances. That it's it, it's a tough environment that they inhabit uh, with the high stakes and uh, and they're reacting to the incentives that are uh, are created that are before them uh, and to sort of understand understand what the game is sort of see it from their point of view and have some distance on it uh, don't get caught up uh, in uh, in the rhetoric that's just electioneering that's just campaigning you know sort of understand that i understand what the game is i guess is what i would say maybe don't assume that they're monsters who just want to rip a pair apart because they're evil but they're desperate and they're trying to win that's it that's a very nice way of summing it up yes uh last question you don't have to say but we always like to keep the conversation going is there anybody you know maybe they're a professor maybe they're an activist someone on the streets whatever that might be willing to be part of an honest conversation like we're having here. You don't have to name anybody, but we always ask and try to keep the conversation going. Well, nobody's jumping to mind just instantly, and I have, I'm have i not sure who all you have talked to, but I'll give it some thought and we'll be glad to um, you know make some suggestions. I really appreciate that, Professor. I will email you a copy of the video shortly, and I want to say thank you for your time. I know you're very busy, and I really appreciate you taking time to help explain this theory. It's a novel theory. Because uh, everybody's going, it's ideology, it's social media, it's the news, you know, and and here, well, hold on, guys, let's let's take a look here, and you know, like if you a hundred years of data, it kind of says something else. It's a novel approach. I think it's one more people need to hear about because all we're hearing about is ideology and social media, and if we just got rid of the apps, everything would be perfect. And this kind of says, uh, fixing apps on your phone isn't going to snap everything back together, folks. Uh, if it's a structural issue like this, we need to be thinking structurally, not what did CNN say and how do we re-regulate news agencies and social media apps? So I find it a unique theory and very important. I think we should look into it more. There's a lot of it because I don't see enough people looking at this and going, is that it? Is that not it? Because if this is right, wow, I, I don't know how you fix a structural situation like that other than, you know, a third party rises because they handled the crisis, some unforeseen crisis we can't see now better. So that's, you know, hope for the future. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Professor. I'll email you shortly, and I want to say thank you again for your time. Thank you. Take care.